Hello everyone, my name is Alicia Silvega and I am a junior studying International and Women's Studies as well as Performing Arts at Sarah Lawrence College. And today I have the honor to introduce you to Dr. Cristina Rivera Garza, our marvelous guest speaker, professor, and award-winning author whose work and approach to writing I find deeply inspiring. She was born in Matamoros, Mexico and studied urban sociology in Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. Later, she moved to the U.S. and received her Ph.D. in Latin American History from the University of Houston, where she is also a professor. She has written, originally in Spanish, six novels, three collections of short stories, five collections of poetry, and three nonfiction books. She has received numerous awards, such as the Roger Calloway's Award for Latin American Literature in Paris in 2013 and the Anna Seggers in Berlin in 2005. She's the only author to win the International Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz Prize twice, in 2001 for her novel Nadie me verá llorar, and in 2009 for her novel La Muerte me da. Dr. Rivera Garza is the, the recipient of the prestigious 2020 MacArthur Fellowship, often referred as the Genius Grant. Her work has been translated into English in numerous languages, including French, Italian, Portuguese, and Korean. The Tiger Syndrome was published by Dorothy Project in the U.S. and translated by Susan Gill Levine and Aviva Kano. Then, her newest, Grieving, Dispatches from a Wounded Country, which is a selection of chronicles, essays, and poems on systemic violence in contemporary Mexico and along the U.S.-Mexico border. It was translated by Sarah Booker and published by the Feminist Press in the U.S., who also published her novel, The Islet Press, in Sarah Booker's translation. Grieving, as described by the New York Times Book Review, is a lucid, poignant collection of essays and poetry, deeply hopeful, ultimately love letters to writing itself and to the power of language to overcome the silence that impunity imposes. Dr. Rivera Garza's resilience growing up in an environment that was not comfortable to her as she describes it allowed her to find the impulse to write. As she beautifully states it, writing came as a result of having to explain to myself the enigma that the world was for me. Enigma. What a beautiful, complex, and profound word that means so many things while bringing such a sense of uncertainty. Dr. Cristina Rivera Garza tests and challenges the tension of language, the friction between two different semiotic systems, two languages, two histories, two cultures, Spanish and English. Exploring that tension through the detective and the translation in the Tiger Syndrome, Garza writes, Algo que no era estrictamente suyo ni mío, un tercer espacio, una segunda lengua en común. And perhaps that third space that Dr. Rivera Garza brings to the table is what humanity needs. Somewhere, not mine, not yours. A third space, a second language in common. Thank you very much and please welcome Dr. Cristina Rivera Garza who will begin reading. Thank you so much for that introduction, <clears throat> uh, Alicia, thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy, thank you for having me here. Thank you to Kate Sambreno and to Heather Cleary and to Una uh, Chong for um, all the all what you did to make this event possible. And obviously thank you, a big thank you to, to your university, right? We, we wouldn't be able to do this to, uh, this kind of these kinds of events without the support of the institutions that we work for. So um, uh, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to start by reading some sections of one of the chapters of um, of grieving uh, these passages from a wounded country. Um, this is a book. We will talk about it. I just have to mention briefly that this piece relates to a very uh, important, very relevant um, artist from Oaxaca um, in Southern Mexico, um, a very, uh, an extremely rich state, a very diverse state in terms of the ecology and the territory, and also in terms of the populations and the languages that are spoken right there. So um, I'm gonna be pronouncing Oaxacan, uh, when, uh, as a uh, you know, description as belonging to this place, Oaxaca, I've heard several pronunciations, but um, 
some are very strange, so I'll just stick with the more, uh, you know, uh, Spanish sounding one. So, así es que muchísimas gracias para los que entienden español, los que son bilingües, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Voy a leer en inglés, pero si en algún momento desean que hagamos alguna pequeña intervención en español, por supuesto que yo estaré muy contenta. Gracias. On 2,501 Migrants by Alejandro Santiago. Thousands of years ago, in what is now the Chinese city of Xi'an, an emperor making preparations for his death and to extend his reign into the next life, ordered his craftsmen to reproduce a life-size statue of every soldier in his army. Using locally sourced materials and well-organized work crews, the artists not only gave each piece a unique face, thus providing them with unique identities, but also placed weapons corresponding to their military rank in their hands. The realistic effect of the assembled statues was such that years after the hated emperor uh, Quinn's death, a peasant mob attacked the terracotta soldiers, uh, disarming, and you could say, lethally wounding many of them. Walking among the statues that Alejandro Santiago and his team of 32 artisan laborers have created in the last six years in the ranch workshop El Sopilote, located in Santiago Chuchu, such as Quitongo, uh, a community close to the tumultuous state capital of Oaxaca, causes a similar sensation that of finding yourself shoulder to shoulder with strangely lifelike beings that at any moment, preferably between sips of mezcal, could begin telling you their stories about crossing the border. Simultaneously fantastic and terrifying, as fragile as a material, as a material they're made of, yet solid in the space they occupy and the air that surrounds them, Santiago's migrants cross one border of a ball, the thin, brittle line we often call reality. Sometimes I look at them from far away, says Santiago in his traveler's voice, which sounds as if it's sliding along a dirt floor. And it seems like they're chatting. Placed around the grounds of the ranch workshop, whether on hills or along a path, it's clear that the migrants prudently observe everything of human proportions and with faces that don't depict, but rather evoke a reality as much internal as external, the statues aren't only a part of the landscape. They are an integral part of daily conversation. This is a little boy about 12 years old. He's healthy, but he took a spill. Santiago half whispers while pointing gravely to one statue's broken leg. With their own stories, their own identities, these clay bodies might even evoke fear in the viewer. You could easily imagine a migration officer years and years after the death of the hated emperor holding up one of these clay migrants at gunpoint. A look of shock on the statue's face, tattoos of the Virgin of Guadalupe on their back as they tried to cross the border again, always again, that misunderstood mutable, mutable line, both uniting and dividing the richest country in the world and its poor neighbor to the south. The nightmare and the dream, that which leaves and that which is about to leave, the here and now and the beyond. Let me see. Uh, a tumultuous beauty runs through the clay migrants. No, this is not what I want to read, I'm sorry. Mike Davies, the brilliant North American critic and author of the classic City of Courts, once argued that the border wall is nothing more than a horrifying political spectacle, effective only in justifying the violence of border crossings and then in reinforcing the power dynamics of US imperialism, the wall hasn't been able to do what walls are supposed to do, to suspend the flow, to stop the passage, to contain the materials. 
The border wall hasn't been able to prevent the incessant crossing of people required by the economy and lifestyle of the United States. This is something that Oaxacan migrants for whom the journey north has become over the years and generations a way of life for entire communities know well. I repeat, a way of life. Confronted with the risks of moving between two countries, the difficulties inherent in exile, the rage of their own exploitation, many of these migrants, as sociologist Laura Velasco Ortiz has analyzed, have created their own forms of community organization to assert their agency in the realities created by their labor. While the statistical claims about Oaxacans in the United States vary, and the figures in different sources span from 30,000 to 500,000 migrants. The majority of them are concentrated in California, introducing not only a language, or in many cases too, Spanish and an indigenous language as well, um, but also forms of sociality and protest in the fields and cities of the Northern neighbor, the Oaxacan community is part of what activists as well as analysts have named the Mexicanization of the United States. The gradual but inexorable process that provokes anxiety in so many, but anticipation in so many others. But the strength and traditions that ensured the dignified survival of the Oaxacan people during their mass migration were only possible at the expense of their intermittent or even ghostly presence in the region of origin. Their bodies are not on the streets where they were born. Their hands do not hold the tools needed to work the land in order to grow corn, agave, or beans. Their eyes do not see the rusted rims of the cars that once ran, that toy. Their feet don't feel, neither out of curiosity nor devotion, the healing waters of Yerbe El Agua, two petrified waterfalls with large quantities of calcium carbonate and two small springs of carbonated water, water which turns the water a greenish blue color. Their voices, their echoes, Alejandro Santiago's 2,501 2, migrants is essentially a meditation on this absence. Uh, 2,501 migrants is a project about the reach of the absent body. Much has been said about the nostalgia of those who leave, but rarely has anyone explored, and even less frequently with clay, the melancholy of those who remain. What the witnesses to the slow process of deterioration, the gradual configuration of ruin, the always fleeting happiness of reunion really see? How do you experience in the flesh the process through which reality empties itself out? When you walk through the clay bodies of the 2,501 migrants, you cannot help but feel that you are surrounded by the work of a solitary yet invented child who constructed his own playmates purely out of desire. There is something of that childlike voracious energy in the clay body's design, especially in the way the sexual organs hang or are open into a stunning dichotomy. There is something of that frenzy, impossible energy in the clay bodies that brings the migrants themselves back to us. And in order to receive and invoke them at the same time to continue playing this extreme game called life, Alejandro Santiago places his 2,501 migrants in the northern mountains of Oaxaca, in Teocoquilco, the Marcos Perez, a town that with their presence, which is to say their total absence, will cease to be a ghost town and will become a town of pure intervention. And if that isn't the power of art, what is? And if that isn't a form of resistance, what is? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Kate Zambrino and I teach in the writing program at um, Sarah Lawrence. Um, and we've been reading 
um, Christina Rivera Garza's work all week. And I'm joined by um, Heather Cleary in the Spanish department, as well as Una Chung um, in literature and women's history. And we are here to facilitate your questions that you might have or comments um, uh, for uh, Dr. Rivera Garza and to, to be in, in conversation. So if you have questions or comments, please, please write them in the chat um, and we will uh, engage with them. Just looking at these now, um, Una and Heather, I don't know if you wanted to perhaps start off. Well, there's some really wonderful questions already in the chat. Maybe we could start there and then I'm happy to jump in with my questions later if there's if there's time. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Alma Thomas, I think Alma's question mm -hmm. perhaps we can start with, which is a question of witness. When writing about with others and sharing important and sensitive stories, what are some of the practices you have to make sure that everyone feels seen and honored in the work? And are those feelings truly possible when sharing stories of others, and then also Anna Mitchell kind of in, engaging with that, with the Taiga syndrome and the essays, the essay about Santiago sculptures, as well as Santiago's sculptures of the migrants. How do you witness and write what is both coming into presence and fading into absence? So this question of, I guess, the ethics of witness telling stories of others, All right, this is such a fundamental question and thank you for asking that in the first place. That, that goes to the heart of uh, much of what I do. I, um, I have described uh, writing as, um, you know, as a critical practice, uh, um, an activity that we actually um, make with others, one that uh, involves our minds and our bodies and, uh, and our spiritual uh, being as well. And uh, I have said uh, many, many times, and, and I repeat it here because I do believe it, is that we are always writing stories that belong to others. We are always dealing with materials that are never our own. If we are writing, uh, if we're committing stories, stories to to the written word, um, we are working. Uh, with others at that point. And that involves, um, that in, uh, what that brings to us as writers is uh, um, the responsibility to think about how, with what kind of care and how to handle these experiences that others have made accessible to us, that others who have voice and who have uh, bodies and communities have been telling each other. And, uh, and so my question, uh, as I start a project, usually involves something like this. I, I, perhaps you have heard because it's repeated very often that uh, the writers should write about what they know best I rather I'm rather suspicious of uh, of this kind of um, of this kind of statement. I I do believe that sometimes we believe that that what is closest to us, especially ourselves, uh, that that we are somehow transparent, that we somehow have direct access to close family members, to what we think, to our own consciousness, for example. But if you really try to write about those issues, you will realize that we are not transparent, that we are rather opaque to ourselves. And the writing even about ourselves involves a very delicate operation uh, in, in dealing with materials that are not necessarily um, um, uh, knowledge, not, uh, they're not necessarily open to our knowledge uh, in a direct manner, right? And, uh, and so we need, or at least that's how I approach these issues, I, I need to do research and research is a form of care. So that, that would be my first point. So I, I just, I'm gonna give you an example. I, I very recently I published a book whose title in Spanish is Autobiografia del Algodón. 
autobiography of cotton. And in this book, I try to trace the migrant experience of my grandparents, uh, my paternal grandparents who walked all the way from uh, El Altiplano, from central Mexico uh, to, uh, to Coahuila in the north, very close to the US-Mexico border where they uh, found job in the coal mines of the area to later settle in the cotton fields around Matamoros in Tamaulipas, where I was born many, many, many years later. And then I was also trying to trace the migrant uh, experiences of my maternal grandparents who, um, who came um, in the opposite route. They had uh, crossed the US-Mexico border as children. They had developed uh, a life, a family life in the United States until they were expelled in the 1930s. Um, uh, this is of course related to the anti-immigrant legislation issued by, by then President Hoover. So they found their way back uh, into Mexico and they met in the, in the Mexican side of the US-Mexico border. And you might think that I should that that um, I'm saying this so clearly, and it might it might appear to you that these are things that I knew, and that therefore I should talk and write about them because they are mine; they belong to me. And yet, I'm able to say what I just said after many years of research, after many years of asking questions, interviewing people, going to places, doing research in archives, um, reading old documents, uh, reading old letters, uh, going and taking samples of soils, taking photographs. Uh, and then as a result of all that, something that had been rather opaque to me became shareable, not clear, not obvious, but something that I could, that I was able to share with the enigma, with the secret that is at the center of the story and that to me is rather untouchable. So what I'm trying to say is that I, I was able to write that story not because I was the granddaughter of these, of these wonderful people, uh, or not only because of that, uh, but because I was able to or I tried very hard in any case to forge a, a present day relationship with them. I wanted to honor their, ex their experiences with first uh, involved getting to know those experiences, the materiality of those experiences on the world. And those are things that we're not born with. These are not things that belong to me just because of the, you know, the color of my skin or my two last names. Those are things that I had to, to work hard to get at. And, and that working hard to me is a sign of care. I wouldn't be able to be here and tell you that I wrote a, a, you know, a book in which I'm trying to trace the migrant story of blah, 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 uh, without um, having done um, that kind of a very delicate and, and, and very detailed work. I think that's that's what, what writing is, is uh, uh, when you pay close attention to the world, when, when all your perception system is on alert, when you are able to, to create those, those kind of linkages with others, with entire community of speakers, of people experiencing the kinds of um, phenomena that you're trying to reach, then I can, I can name myself, I can say that I am a writer. Um, I'm saying this because I do believe that we, all of us, uh, tell stories. And that's how we become social. That's how we become part of a larger uh, uh, community. Um, but writers not only tell stories, we write stories. And writing, I think, uh, at its heart, involves that ethical operation how am I, gonna, am, am I gonna be dealing with materials that don't belong to me? And how am I gonna be able to write my name, right? Taking responsibility for the kind of story that finally gets shared. So thinking through that, uh, doing that kind of labor, um, you know, taking every single step to, to get as much information as you can, this in a very practical level, but to get as, to get as close as you can in a more spiritual level, I would say. I think that's, uh, that's um, 
there's an inevitable step if you if you want to uh, pose those ethical questions. And if you are a writer, then uh, then there is no escape. There is no way that you can proceed without posing those questions first to yourself and then to your readers in doing that. And if we want writing to really keep that potency, that critical potency in itself, I think we should be able to convey and to share um, the questions. And that's what, what gives a structure, that's what gives form, I think, to, to a book. So I think I'll, I'll stop there right now because sometimes I'm, I'm long-winded and, I, and I, I answer too many questions at the same time, but I'll let you ask the questions now. Well, I just, I just wanted took it. to, uh, oh, go on. Okay. I'm sorry, Kate. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, um, for what you've just shared. And I just love your phrase about overcoming the dominion of what's our own or what's one's own. And I really appreciated this phrase because it captured for me something I felt for a long time, but actually had a hard time articulating um, because I was thinking of it in very critical ways. But we know what it feels like to be, to experience this dominion of something that's in oneself or that we do to ourselves, And sometimes we just assume that some sort of self-reflexivity or autonomy is necessarily liberating or, you know, but, but it's not. And I, I appreciate that you give so much texture and feeling to that idea. It's not just an idea to me. And, you know, I spent a lot of my time meditating and things like that, the material practices, but there is something that only writing can communicate about this. And that was uh, one of the key phrases. And then other, um, other writing you talk about post-autonomous art, uh, post-autonomous writing or the post-autonomous subject. And then finally in this, uh, your essay about um, Alejandro Santiago, you um, quote Marx about the five senses containing all the history of labor. And it, it was just like a magical reframing of that, of that idea from Marx, which is um, completely disappropriated here and given completely new terrain to Rome. And I think the senses, what I've been, I really feel I've been studying the, this question of the senses in, in your writing. And that's a place where, as you're saying, um, we have to, what is, what, just because it's our family, our history, our story, even our body, even our senses, doesn't mean we just own them or have dominion over them, sometimes quite the contrary. And yeah. that's really a place where everything we sense, so intimate, right? We sense with our being, but it's, it's always sensing the other. The senses only contain the other. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to kind of highlight those lines from, from your writing and and I must say that in um, then in the more, I don't know, yeah, I don't know the genre words, like in like Taiga syndrome, I, I don't know what I should label that, but uh, in that kind of story, active storytelling, um, we really experience that. And I must say it would be terrifying if the storyteller weren't very kind and there one feels that quality of the care and the labor of the writing. Um, so um, I don't know, I just thought I would offer a few of these. these no, thank you. Thank you, Una, so much for those comments. And uh, there is so much food for thought there. I um, very briefly would like to, to share um, the following. I, um, you know, I think you're quite right. I'm, uh, I'm usually, um, I tend to think of writing uh, less as a, as a sharing of stories and more as an invitation to, that we issue to others to experience something in, in their own bodies. That, that, um, th so that, that's the issue of the invitation. There is an experience here for you. There is something that is calling to all your senses. And, and, uh, and I would like for you to, to go through this with me. And at my disposal, the only tools that I have, which are very humble, very, very powerful too, is this language. There is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a materiality in its own, and I can, 
work with God in, in, in a range of ways uh, in order to be able to, to address your, your, uh, your senses, your system, uh, your perception system. So, so if, if the writing is successful, then, uh, then your body and my body will be able to experience something similar, right? Or, or a version in any case, uh, in connection to this magical object that is uh, the book or, or more specifically the text, right? And that, that is one of the reasons why it's so important to me that, that uh, to start um, you, you know, my projects and, and writing projects in general, uh, uh, questioning that, that uh, the ownership of experience and, and our, our position, our specific position through language. I have said uh, many times in my workshops that we can write without character, we, we can um, uh, get rid of plot, we can, uh, you know, avoid adjectives, you know, there are a, a series of things that you might do away with and still be able to write. But the one thing that I believe is absolutely necessary is, uh, is your position, your relationship to language. And, and that, is, uh, that is answered in the, in the very structure and the form that the writing um, takes, finally. And um, as, as some of you may know, I've been working uh, for a long time now with, with something that I've been calling disappropriation. And uh, it, it began in, uh, some years ago when we were having as a, as a trade, as a community, as a writing community, these very heated discussions about issues of appropriation. And, and um, very simply put, what I was discussing there is that uh, appropriation is what literature does. Literature with a capital L is what has been done. That's what art does. Uh, art is a, as a field, as an autonomous field, is being a process of appropriation of everything that is not art. Uh, so um, if, if this is true, and I tend to believe that it is, I think our critical stand against that is to, to show that, to make this manifest, and to incorporate those elements, these other people's voices, other people's texts, um, these material presences in our, in our, in our very, you know, writing itself, in, in order to, uh, uh, to release that dominion over what, what is supposed to be uh, uh, over, over one's own uh, possessions or, or ownership, so to speak. So the whole idea is a little bit more complicated than that, uh, uh, obviously, but, but to me, it was very central um, as we were discussing this in, in workshops. I mean, this is not an idea that I was kind of thinking on my own all alone in my ivory tower, right? Uh, but this was something that was very hotly debated in, in workshops as, uh, some years ago. And I was uh, in the United States, but I was uh, taking these ideas uh, to the many uh, writing workshops that I was always, uh, also offering in Mexico, uh, specifically in Oaxaca, by the way. So it was very interesting to me to see the context contrasting views and uh, the, the difference in emphasis and uh, issues that dealt um, mostly with notions of territory and notions of, uh, you know, the body in a specific context and, and issues like that, that came always at the forefront when I discussed these issues in, in places like Oaxaca. So I've been trying to play that kind of uh, uh, bridge, you know, that intellectual bridge, expanding a conversation that I think is fundamental to what we do whether we live in the United States and write in English, or even if we live like now, Heather is in Mexico City and speaking Spanish. So I think that belongs, that comes with the territory, that comes with what we do or attempt to do as writers. But thank you so much for, for that meditation, Una. Yeah. Um, to also, um, to, to pick up from that and to think about, I think that there's this beautiful, interesting, productive tension in both Tiger Syndrome and in the essays that we read in Grieving between um, um, an honor and ethics and compulsion to tell the stories of others, to have this care of research, but also just picking up Anna Mitchell's question again and kind of um, circling to it, this question of um, absence yeah. and silence yeah. and disappearance. Um, you quote throughout um, Elaine and throughout grieving Elaine Scarry's body and pain, um, this idea that pain is beyond language. 
yeah. right? That pain is something that we can't know that even though there's a ethical need to see the other, to meet the other, it's we cannot really know. Um, and to just, um, I kind of had hurriedly put Anna Mitchell's question with Amma's, but they are a little separate. Anna Mitchell is really asking, how do you witness and write both presence and absence? Like this yeah. action of disappearance. So there's, I mean, there is, there's actually a detective story in Tiger Syndrome. There is a sense of chasing yeah. after disappearance, but there are archives, there are notebooks. But I feel when you write of, um, when you write of this, of Santiago's um, clay sculptures, there's, you write, um, you know, it is as if they could speak, right? This, this, but this, the silence yeah. within their stories. Um, so how do you think of silence yeah. and absence and disappearance absence. in terms yeah. of this, this thinking through other people's stories and this question yeah. of witness. No, that's a, that's a very important question too. Thank you for, for asking and, and um, you're yeah, posing that um, to this in the discussion. You know, I, I will start approaching this question by using the words of a Mexican writer that I've been doing some research on uh, lately. It's, it's Jose Revueltas, is uh, our great communist writer, our, our great rebel. Um, it's so, so radical that even the Communist Party expelled him from its ranks several times and he spent time in jail and, you know, he's uh, this um, larger than life uh, author in Mexican, in Mexican literary history. Uh, I admire him very much, but I, but I especially have been quoting a phrase um, uh, that I read in one of in, in a really small essay in a, in a journalist uh, article in journal uh, in a newspaper article, in fact, about um, the relationship between the the, the writer and uh, the land. That's what, what he said. El, el, el autor y la tierra. Although here land and earth uh, might be, might, we might want to use either of those depending on, on the emphasis. But um, uh, he claims in, in, in this essay that the most important question that we'll ever ask ourselves, just as human beings, not even as writers, is, is the question of belonging. And for him, belonging means uh, that our bodies have found or place, have placed themselves in specific uh, sites. Uh, on the earth. Uh, and so because we have a body, because we're material bodies, uh, uh, he, he speaks of this belonging, of this location, this ubicación in Espanol, uh, as, as something that pertains not only to human beings, but also to our, now we would say companion species, uh, to animals, uh, to plants, to rocks, uh, so he, he was a neo-materialist of Anne Lelettre, I think. And, uh, he was also an avant-gardist in that sense. But in asking that question, he said, you know, uh, and this is important and it is political to the core because one of the things that I have to ask myself is how come I am where I am? How come I came to occupy this site, this specific space on earth? Because if I'm here, that means that someone else is not here. That means that I, uh, if we accept the fact that we, that, that we share this space, that there is no such a thing as a tabula rasa, there is no blank page for our experience. This is a radical shared experience. Us as human beings in connection with other species on the earth, then the basic question about belonging becomes, who else is not here? Who, whose absence has made my presence possible? And if we really do research around that question, we'll find that violence is usually there as one of the many reasons why I am here and someone else is not here. So the question about, in, it, it, I, I, I'm trying to link this question about absence, which is usually a question about the past, right? But it's very much connected to our presentness to the, the reasons why this body in which I live is right here and not, some, not somewhere else. Uh, to me, I think I, I, I was 
think trying to think through something like that. But when I read it in, uh, in Jose Revueltas, it became so clear. Uh, it's just like, that is so true. Once we start asking the question of um, belonging, which is the question about our bodies in connection to other, body, other bodies, our bodies in connection to other materialities, then the story becomes uh, very complex. The story becomes very dramatic at times. And usually there is, there are traces of violence in trying to ans answer that story. And where, if, if there is violence, there is silence too. Uh, I, of course, don't believe that writers are here, uh, or I don't see myself as a writer to, that, that is giving voice to, to anyone. I think uh, I share this space with uh, people perfectly capable of, uh, you know, uttering and expressing their own voices. The problem, of course, is that we not always um, uh, listen to them, right? And so in uh, rather than giving voice, I, I see myself and the work of many writers as providing um, a meeting space uh, through which we can listen to each other, through which that unlanguage of pain, for example, could be articulated, through which we can use um, the the range of languages that we have access to, right? Through uh, that, that we at times use as uh, uh, to convey the unspeakable. So there are many issues that that relate to our bodies. That um, when um, when trauma prevents us from articulating, well, there are other languages that. Uh, serve as translators, uh, translations of sorts. And I think tapping of, on those translations are, uh, is, is such an important and, and politically relevant task too. So, um, so it's not a matter of, of listening to the silence, but, but actually of paying attention, open, opening again, our, not only our ears, but our, our, um, our perception system to embrace the experience of others. And in order to do so, and, and that's where grieving, I think, comes into play, we, we have to be able to, to, to embrace pain uh, because that's where, where we are the most vulnerable and that's where we are open. And, uh, and we are, um, you know, I'm very aware of the difference between, and, and I talked a little bit about that in this book, uh, one, one, one thing is to be vulnerable and a, and a rather different one is to be, to be rendered powerless. Uh, so I, I do believe that if we are able to create this shared space where, um, where our vulnerab vulnerability can come into play, then uh, we are talking very much about writing, writing in a way that is, you know, um, uh, writing in a way uh, in, a, in a way in which care matters. So we are, um, because I think all these issues in, uh, at different levels in, in, in different projects, I'm, um, I am I'm usually um, very much in agreement with something that, um, what's her name, Christina Sharp said in that wonderful book in, in, uh, in The Waking, uh, you know, talking about a, a past that is never the past and, and how the past is an eruption always, how, how that past creates that present and how the afterlife of, of violence is, um, is, a, is a backbone, it's a material that, that we have to contend with. And, and I do believe that we, we did that when I was talking earlier about research, research as a form of care. Um, I, I was in fact uh, thinking very much about ways in which we can um, be very conscious about this past that is not the past, about the way in which uh, uh, our present and the tools of our present can be employed to, to bring up that energy, uh, you know, the pain and, and, the, and the wound and the hurt, but also the energy that, that accompanies uh, these, these, these very difficult and complex situations. So I think, uh, um, if I'm honest with you, that's, that's what crosses my mind when, when I'm asked about issues of absence and, and issues of silence. Um, uh, I, I do believe that these are um, radical human experiences. Uh, this is, these are ways in which entire communities have been broken and, and the reason why many 
such communities have come back uh, in ways that are always, always um, so stunning to me, and so mind blowing. And, uh, and uh, I see myself as, as, you know, following these traces, trying to reconstitute, re re recreate that experience, not only the story. So I'm not, not, I'm not only trying to get through your, you know, through your intellect, but, but I'm trying to, to aim, I aim for, for your whole being, for your whole body. And if my story, uh, my book, my writing, by any chance um, uh, ends up in your dreams, right? Then I would say this book is successful, right? So I, I trust uh, the, the presence of the writing in the dreams more than the reviews, although if the reviews are good, I cherish them too, so. <laughs> Something, um, something you said a little bit earlier um, resonated with one of the things that I find most powerful about your work, which is the way that you are so insistent on the situatedness of the body of the writer and the political dimensions of that. Um, but another thing that you do that, that I find incredible is you, in the same moment, you also insist on the situatedness of the reader, right? Um, yeah. you, you place you place the reader and make the reader consider where they're reading from as well. Um, and there's this, uh, I would love, I don't know if we have time to read, but there's a passage in the Taiga syndrome where you talk about translation and the kind of the lag between the time the enunciation is made and it's processed and then repeated. And, um, and it's just, it's such an incredibly centering way of, um, of talking about communication and community and, and how we receive. And I, I was just wondering if you could talk about how you understand the political dimensions of that stance. You know, wonderful. Thank you so much for that question, Heather, too. Uh, I, uh, I tend to think in that way about readers because that's very much the kind of reader that I was. So, and I, I was very aware when I, you know, there are plenty of books that have, um, shaped who I am. I, I've, uh, I've, I've been um, totally transformed by some books. Books have allowed me to see the world uh, in, in different ways, but they have allowed me to live my life in, in different ways too. So it's been, a, it, it's a, it's been a very material connection to begin with. And, uh, and I've been trying to make, um, since I've been, I've been intrigued by, by those transformations, by how strong they are, and how important they are. I've been trying to think very carefully about what made that possible. And, um, and I'm a materialist at heart, you, you know, and, and now a neo-materialist at heart too. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm usually concerned about the, the how we produce and reproduce the context in which we live. Uh, what, uh, as I said earlier, that question uh, posed by Jose Revueltas is one that is guiding me very much right now. So how come I'm here? How come I'm not any, anywhere else, et cetera? So I think that that question about what we as readers bring into that communion, with re which reading is, is, is extremely relevant because we are not uh, tabula rasas ourselves. Uh, and because, um, you know, books are part of a larger ecology and, and there is a conversation taking place, one that we tap into or interrupt or question by, uh, by a reading of, of, these, of these messages. And, and, and what is very interesting to me is that we're all exchanging messages whose ultimate meaning is just up for grabs. So uh, it's not something that is, um, uh, you know, built in the story, but is created in as, as we share that and as, as it becomes part of our, of our world. Uh, thinking those those issues to me is is um, uh, if, if we want to answer those questions, we have to to pose questions about uh, you know we have to bring up issues of power, because we as readers come from different families, we live in different cities, we speak different languages, uh, and our languages have different standings right in in the cities and and countries in which we live. I grew up uh, uh, speaking Spanish, and uh, and in Mexico, Spanish is is the language of the empire. It's the language of conquest, right? But then I crossed the border, and I and I and I became a dweller in this country and and my Spanish the same Spanish is spoken with the same kind of accent the same grammar is no longer the language of the empire is the language of um, this language without a state 
It's a language uh, that is not defended by an army. It's a language that is constantly questioned, right? And uh, a language that, as I, I often say, is with um, uh, proudly a language of labor, uh, but also a language that has been denied uh, the, the, uh, the possibility even of um, you know, reaching uh, other um, aspects of life, specifically you know, the, the, the creative life as such. So, you, you know, they appear to be very simple questions, even transparent questions, but once you start to, to follow the thread, then they become inescapable questions. And they, they lead us to, to, to questions about imbalances, about hierarchies. And I mentioned language because uh, I know that you are a translator and that you just published a wonderful book, but obviously um, about, translate, about translation too, but uh, obviously there are other hierarchies, gender being uh, a, a very obvious one, race, class, ethnicity, uh, many other aspects that are uh, um, intrinsic to what we are and that define what we read, how we read, how we talk about what we read. And to me, there is no way of, of looking at that, at that operation without, um, uh, without its politics. That is to say, without the power that is crisscrossing every single one of those movements. Oh, and by the way, both of you, some of you have, have mentioned Tiger Syndrome, uh, that is, it is published by this wonderful, wonderful uh, press, Dorothy Press, uh, whose uh, editors, Mari Rieger and Danielle Witten, I love, and I know Kate loves too, uh, personal friends. Uh, I have to tell you that it's, it's been quite interesting that uh, uh, the Tiger Syndrome is the last novel, novel the last fiction uh, uh, piece that I've written. And it's been quite, quite some time now, uh, about what, eight, 10 years, something like that, perhaps even more, I'm not so sure. Um, it was many of, uh, of the issues that concerned me at that point, and you are right, Kate, uh, it had to do with absence, it had to do with the limits of what is real and what is unreal, about loneliness, about translation, obviously, about how come we understand each other, how come uh, even when we are going through extreme experiences, we're able, in fact, to, to, to reach out in some cases, right? And, and so uh, I think I was able to put that in, into that work um, uh, within you know, the framework of fiction. But then after that, it's been so difficult for me to go back to fiction fiction. I mean, I'm, uh, the autobiography of Cotton uh, is, a, is a work that we decided to call a novel. Uh, because I believe that fiction in this book is the host of many other forms of writing that without fiction, that book wouldn't be possible, but not because uh, it follows or abides by the supposed, in any case, rules of fiction. So I, uh, over the years, I became very critical of fiction and what fiction does or can do in a world in which um, uh, uh, much of it has become fiction, right? And, uh, uh, and, and but then I find myself uh, reconsidering fiction, and at least in this uh, in this position as as a as a host, as an embrace, so to speak, that brings in and that uh, um, that lets bloom uh, these other. Uh, I wouldn't call it genres per se, but just other forms of writing, other forms of uh, other possibilities of, of language as such. Um, well, let's, let's turn to one of what I have to imagine is one of your most recent pieces of writing, which is your beautiful pandemic essay, Touching is a Verb, which so many of the questions in the chat, which are beautiful comments and questions, which I would like to go to deal with community, grief, the pandemic, which your essay illuminates so well. Would you be willing to read for us a little bit of it of first? Of course, I was not prepared for that. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, if I read that um, small section, touching is a verb, I think that, that, that goes to the heart of the matter and, uh, and that'll take us to another uh, section of this conversation. So I'm in page 157 in case that you have the book close by. 
As a virus is spread through proximity, especially through breath and touch. And I was writing these, by the way, during the first pandemic, during the first phase of the pandemic. We didn't know what we now know. But uh, and, and I, as many of you, became very uh, concerned, in fact, a bit paranoid about what my hands were touching. And that was very much the source of uh, at least this section of the essay. Especially through breath and touch, we have been compelled to become more aware of our bodies. It seems like a simple operation, it isn't. The contemporary means of capitalist production that call calculated machine has accustomed us to living under the illusion that we are incorporeal. We can work endlessly, we can consume endlessly. If we were in a story by the Salvadorian writer, Claudia Hernandez, and by the way, I recommend her highly. It's such a wonderful writer. And who's, uh, one of her, uh, a book of hers is recently out in English too. So sorry for the interruption. Uh, if, we were, uh, if, we, well, um, if we were in a story by the Salvadoran writer, Claudia Hernandez, we would be those characters who even when dead, even when I already turn into walking cadavers, continue uh, swip sweeping our entire car to get into work or pulling out our credit card at cash registers. US capitalism is like this, literally disembodied. The illusion of not having a body, supported, supported in part by the widespread consumption of pills and various medications, leads to the perception that we have no other connection to the world besides the technological connections. From the spell of abstraction hangs the absence of solidarity with our surroundings, and at the end of it all, indolence. That which does not touch us, that which we do not know touches us, does not hurt us. But now that we are stopped, now that we know that our hands are lethal weapons and not just as Kant wanted, what differentiates us from animals, we cannot not think about it. The rematerialization of our worlds in times of deceleration forces questions that are political at the very root. Who else has touched this object that I am touching right now? Which is, which is another way of asking, where does it come from? Who produces it? In what conditions of exploitation or sanitation is this thing in my hand created? With what quantity of virus? It took the anthropologist Anna Singh years and many years to answer those questions in relation to the Matsutake, a revered Japanese mushroom that grows in wooded zones that have survived processes of devastation. Indeed, there are a ton of hands described in her book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, those of migrant workers, those of businessmen, those of forest rangers, those of police, those of immigration agents, callous hands and soft hands, hands accustomed to caresses, hands that have never felt the relief of moisturizing lotion, moisturizing lotion. To trace the labor of hands in the processes of production and reproduction in our world, this is an intimately political task. And right now, it's an inescapable task. In fact, our lives depend on asking these questions and paying full attention to the answers. Everything we have close by, and right now, we know that we're always, that we always have been close to so many other hands, affects us because it implicates us. This could well open the door to the end of indolence. I was very um, optimistic, it seems, uh, those, those early months of the pandemic. I'm talking about the end of the violence, I mean, the end of the indolence part. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, I'm just reading through these, you know, the, I think there's such a question that we have that you you ask so beautifully in this essay in which um, the writers here are asking as well is how how are we to be together yeah. now yeah yeah how how can we be together as bodies now yeah and and grieve together yeah yeah well that's a question of our times 
Uh, we are going through one uh, uh, massive tragedy. We are experiencing loss in ways that at least younger generations have never been aware of. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that when I was writing Autobiografia del Algodón, I, uh, I had to realize, I was forced to realize that my grandfather had gone through the uh, influenza pandemic of 1918 and that he had survived that. Uh, a little piece of information that I had been, it, had, it, must, it could have been um, something really minor in, in the whole context of his life, but read in connection to the, our pandemic became uh, you know, such a massive discovery too. And uh, as I was saying there, uh, it, it, it seems to me that one of the, the, the pieces of knowledge that we have gained or that is being forced upon us is, uh, has developed in, in relationship to that awareness, the force awareness about how the experience and the labor of others is so intrinsic connected to what we do and how we are. And, and, and in many ways that goes uh, to, to say that, um, we are we're always with others and there is no there is no escape uh we we are connected in a in a in a plethora of ways in a, in a myriad of ways and and i think our our task or what i see as my task right now is to to explore those many connections to bring them into the open to work with them as openly as i can because what um, the disembodied, the illusion of disembodiedness, what, what has cast upon us is, is that, that illusion that, that we are segregated, that we don't belong, that, 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 that we are lonely and, and we're not. Uh, but the problem, of course, with accepting these, these possibilities that comes uh, that, that even thinking about it comes with a full sense of responsibility because then we're not only um, responsible for ourselves and our inner circle, but then we become responsible for people that we hardly see. You know, the, the person who is uh, working on the fields and, and pulling that lettuce, the person who is hacking uh, my radishes, the person who is working with, in the meat industry, you know, the, the, the person who is, is responsible for you know, the, the, the production of the many little objects that constitute my way of life. And just bringing that into the open and, and recognizing that the label of essential workers is not enough, that these are essential human beings for, for the kind of, of life that we lead uh, in this country and, and, and on the globe as such. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, in, in, at a first, um, um, my first uh, reaction was like, well, finally, we, we have been, we're being forced to think through this. And, 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 and if we are able to do that responsibly, then there is a chance that, that we, um, we leave behind uh, these, uh, the armies, as I call them, of, of indolence. Uh, because indolence, after all, is just uh, this uh, militant indifference. You know, and difference that is, is direct, very specifically directed to specific areas of our experience in our world. So that in the first place. And then, uh, of course, we've spent um, many hours uh, at home. Uh, for many of us, uh, it, it was a, a, a recognition, a, a reaccommodation, a reconnection to homes that uh, I don't know about your experience, the experience was like before the pandemic, but I was traveling very often. And I came home at night, tired, uh, hardly paying attention to furniture, to objects, to technology, to dishwashers, to dishes, to elements that have now become tremendously important. And, uh, and I think that's, that's so relevant too, that it's not only a process of um, recognizing the material linkages that uh, produce and reproduce a world, but the, but the materialization of our daily lives and being, uh, of course, I'm, I'm speaking obviously from the perspective of someone very privileged. I, I am a professor, I'm able to do my job through these screens and, uh, and I'm tenured, so it would be, rather difficult to, to fire me, although, well, 
as the situation is, you never know. So I should speak for that in the future, right? But um, so, but but I just want to acknowledge that I know I'm speaking from a from a, a rather privileged position, and and that's the reason why I I was able to well to to take care of myself and and my family and to think about um, many of the elements that, that found its way into this essay, which is to say that in order to write uh, in many ways, uh, you, you'll have to find your refuge. You have to be a little bit, a little bit protected from danger in order to be able to, to utter those words. And that's the reason why all that discussion about the ethics of it, the ethics of writing is so relevant because if you are writing, you are somewhat safe. If you're writing, you have a place, you have that connection with language, you have found in a way you, a, a form of refuge. And, and that in itself is, is just so precious and we have to defend it with our hearts and bodies, I think. But uh, the other issue now is that we've been living this life for a year. Many of us have a lost um, friends, friends of friends. I don't think that, that, that we, have, we will come out of this one untouched. We know what it is like to, to lose dear people. Uh, we know what it is like to, to mourn and to grieve. And uh, I, I was gonna say, I come from a country very used to grieving and, and, and that might appear, and it might appear for a moment that I'm, I'm only speaking about Mexico, but I've been living in this country for 30 years and I come from this country too. And in this country, we're also used to grieving because we've been losing rights, we've been losing uh, opportunities, we've been losing um, um, the kind of uh, structural issues that, that I think we, we, we better get ready to defend. Uh, so I tend to see that, that grieving process as, um, as a practice uh, that brings us together. We never grieve, I said in this book, in the first person singular, we always grieve with others. Grieving is a practice like writing that we do with others. And, um, and grieving use, uses um, a range of languages in order to be able, able to express, as I said earlier, the inexpressible. Um, I, uh, I'm going to refer again to, to the book by Christina Sharp in The Waking, uh, because she, I think her concept of wake work is, uh, I find it so relatable to what I, what I speak of when, when, I, when I speak of grieving, of dolerse in Spanish. In fact, it is not a literal translation, and Heather can tell you that. It's so difficult to just translate the, the, the reflexive form of the verb adoler. And uh, we tried uh, to use, we tried several options, but at the end, um, I thought that grieving uh, conveyed the kind of social practice, community practice that make, makes grieving not only the moment in which we break and come to our knees and beg for mercy, but also the moment in which we, stand, we raise up with others and we joined the, the voices and experiences of others to create uh, um, an emotional community and a community that, that tends to expand across borders and doesn't need specific you know, IDs, passports or documentation. So I place a lot of relevance in that and the possibility of, of uh, forging the transnational emotional communities. And, uh, and that is something that we will be able to do only if we embrace the fact that we are in pain and, uh, uh, and that we share that pain. And uh, the important thing at the same time is that once we start to think about the sources of suffering, then we get into the other side, into the walk side of grieving. Right, because this is not just something that happens for the sake of it. This is not just something that naturally overcame us. There is a responsibility here. There are issues that have to do with the Anthropocene, with extinction of life forms in the planet, with the responsibility or lack of thereof of, um, of factories and industries. So there are decisions that we can make, and there are points that we can make as communities in order to be able 
to prevent that suffering from happening again. And that is a woke moment. That is what, what grieving can gift us with. And, um, and the reason why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always saying like we should embrace it, not because we wanna become passive victims, not because we, we have no hope, not because we, we have surrendered uh, to everything that is around us, but just because of the opposite, because it, it, once you embrace this suffering, then you have to ask why. How come it is here and not other forms of, of social life? And, and if you take those questions seriously, then uh, you'll have to uncover the sources of that misfortune. And, uh, and as with the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene, usually the sources of that misfortune uh, is something in which we have a part of. And, uh, and then, you know, with that consciousness regained, I think we can do something because now we are together. Uh, so that's, that's why grieving to me, or this um, wake work, as Sharpe calls it, is, is just so relevant. And so it's especially at this point when we are, when we are experiencing, experiencing loss in, in ways unimaginable just a, a year, a year ago. I thought I would um, uh, just uh, read a little from uh, Aaliyah's comment in the chat, following up on the notion of research as a form of care. I think um, Aaliyah's thinking here about that quality of listening and learning and turning to something and how in research, we can actually learn something that shows us how to connect with others and um, she's very interested in grieving and loss. Um, so I just wanted to mention that here because I think you're speaking to large tragedies but also the intimacy of everyday yes. life and we've all collectively yes. done something large and small together for incredible duration which is which is amazing to me and um, you know Christina Sharp also has those incredible figures of spaces like the hold and like I think of like where wakes have happened and Heather you were talking about the situatedness of the of both writer and reader and it just takes me back to earlier the um the image of the meeting place of mm -hmm. presence and absence which seems simple enough to say in a sentence but if you think about what it means that we're playing with absence presence as this flickering dialogue or mm -hmm. whatever kind of movement, but that they meet, you know, yeah. like what kind of space can hold presence and absence together and not fix them, where one is necessarily dominant over the other. I mean, it's amazing the, the work of assembling a sentence where once you have it, you know, it, it activates a certain ability to think and feel, but it's, I think it's kind of a shocking idea that this could yeah. meet and that this kind of grieving could happen in that sort of a meeting place that, you know, if we're thinking about the wake, the shift, the hold, um, presence, absence as um, bringing intimacy to research, we don't really think of as an intimate sphere, but we are intimately connected to what's not here, to what's past. So all of that is um, really beginning to build a different kind of world. And it's um, definitely, I guess what I, I, you know, kind of, I wanted to bring in Elia's comment here and just sort of echo the sense that it's, it's very much a world we need to figure out how to live in. And I think that's, you know, what we're all thinking about here and questioning together. What are the tools we have? Like even just in this hour and a half we have together, like what tools have we collected here with which to think of building that kind of world together? And, um, you know, in Asian American literature, I often think how hard it is to teach the history, which is based on something like exclusion of immigration. And it's definitely in uh, Santiago's work, this question of 
how can you build history? How can you grieve? How can you build connection? And commu- what, what is there to witness when something has not been allowed to enter? It's so hard to grieve something that hasn't happened, you know, and to think of, understand that that's loss. And I guess that's what happens in the wake. But I think I just wanted to emphasize that it's, um, you know, when we're together talking, it feels easy, but in case, you know, after eight o'clock, it will feel hard again for us to be in this space that um, I, I just want to also bring in your notion of the trans care. And it, and I love, you know, places, you, you talked about the necessity of our relationship to language. And you've also said, um, it may be that we don't write in our mother mother tongue. Maybe we don't even have that. And that's so important also because our common ground is not the fact that we all have some origin somewhere and we respect them, but actually there is a meeting place where you can only enter if you leave those origins behind. So I just love how this is all coming together around something very concrete, but that concrete um, in order to live it, we have to also let go some of the, what we think is concrete in terms of, you know, the, the ground we stand on, the, the standing and sitting and, and how that, that happens in the world. Um, it's just so interesting, all what you just said. I, um, you know, I, I, I grew up with um, um, a family that was moving continuously, uh, a father who became a scientist and were very suspicious of all kinds of religion. So um, when I learned, when I started to read books, when I started to read poetry and literature, that became my, my closest experience of, of the sacred. And uh, that, that it, it literature embodied that, that experience in many ways. And I think that's the reason why in, um, in, uh, uh, in important ways, for me, that meeting ground that you're describing is, is something that I'm able to approach or have a sense of uh, through the process of writing. Uh, it, it seems to me that very often it's, it's easy to, to um, convey these, these very complicated, multi-layered relationships through discussions about form and genre and you know, to intellectualize the whole process, but at its heart, I think you're so right. There is this, um, this, this experience that is so hard to, to, to know but it's at its center. And it's the, it's the approaching, in the approaching to that, that we create the, the very possibility of inhabiting for fleeting moments, someone else's body. I mean, that's, that's what I was trying to get at when, when, when we were talking about the, the system of perception, right? Because that's what, and that's what love does. That, that's what, uh, what, uh, what, when you ask for the impossible, that's what you ask, right? The possibility of being here in, in, in in different shapes and, and, and in a connection that we might be multi-layered and rich and dynamic. And uh, for better or worse, I, I tend to ascribe that, that very possibility, that meeting ground to, to literature. And, and, and that's the reason why it's very hard for me to see it just as a, as a conveying of stories. I mean, of course it is important. Of course the, the narrative part is, is relevant, but uh, these other issues that are so hard to convey and that uh, you are right, we, we, we can um, uh, give us some kind of passwords in this conversation, some codes, and we know what we're talking about, but once we close this session and we go back to our places and, and look at our, our, our specific worlds, it, it has, you know, it has that capacity of, uh, these, this world has that capacity of uh, uh, reinvent itself and, and grace us with that sense of, of the enigma again and again. And, and so going back and forth, I think it's what, what makes that relationship to, to, to writing. And to me, writing is, is precisely that, that uh, is centered around that form of research as, as caring. Uh, so just to, to go back at, at the beginning of, of your comment and, and, and emphasizing this interconnectedness for me is just uh, absolutely, absolutely relevant. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Mm-hmm. Um, just to continue with that, I feel that, that the last essay in grieving feels 
like an exhortation to students or to writers to keep writing. Um, and there's a line, I mean, it's called keep writing, it's wonderful, but there's this line, um, because those who write will never adapt. And I think this connects with um, Declan McKenna's question, um, what do you see as the role of writings about grief, specifically in social movements, alongside protest legislation, community building to challenge state violence? In what ways can writing fill gaps left by these other tactics? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was I was saying at the beginning that that um, I, I deeply believe that writing is is critical practice, and if we're lucky, uh, it will translate or it translates immediately into uh, uh, you know it's critical thinking, and it might translate into critical practice with others, uh, and, and the connection is established through all the the series of uh, of steps that we walk together in this conversation right invoking questions about place about belonging about uh, our in deep deep interconnectedness um i i i believe that writing is a, is a form of activism uh, that in and of itself uh, language is i said humble but is powerful and it's something that we share. It's a vector. It's an it's an energy. It's a force, and we share it. And um, uh, so very often um, uh, we obey, or we honor, or we uh, work against um, narratives, and we live in, in world you know, in in a world in which there are competing narratives, there are dominant ones, of course, and but fortunately, uh, usually if you pay attention, if you ask the right questions, you'll realize that, the, that there are competing uh, ways of looking at the world and, and being in the world. And I think writing has um, that capacity of igniting one's, in, one's imagination, of igniting that, that critical lens, of looking in between the sentences, below the surface, you know, x-raying through, um, through bodies and, and context. Uh, the best pieces of writings, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader, of course, as many of you are, and um, when um, the best pieces of, of writing are, are the ones who taught me how to um, go through life in ways that repel the kind of violence that I abhorred and, and feared. And uh, so I learned that at home, I learned that in conversations, I learned that in my community, but my community were also books and were also pieces of writing that, that very much expanded that sense that I was not alone and that uh, my voice mattered, that I could be heard. And uh, if nothing else, I believe that that's something that, that writing is capable of doing, not always does it. Uh, because obviously there is always, there are several ways of writing, and and, and there are some authors that write in um, in conformity to the world in which we live. And uh, I I like to say that the kind of writing that I care about, the one that has been so central to my life, um, and so in reshaping everything that I am and, and will be, is very much related to the writing of those who wanted something else, who were able to imagine, imagine something else. Um, that is so valuable, that is so precious, that imagination it teaches us to begin with that this that, that we are living is not, is, not a, a, is not destiny. It wasn't supposed to be here. It wasn't meant to be here. We can change it. There are other possibilities. And that, which is so, so basic, so transparent, I find it so powerful. And I think that's something so intrinsic to writing. If, um, if I didn't believe this, in fact, it would be very difficult for me to justify before myself the fact that I spent so many hours you know, in front of this little screen. And if I believe that this is something that I do on my own, you know, in my head, just going crazy, I will go crazy, in fact. Um, but, um, and, and that's why I insist on something that, that for many of you is, is perhaps very clear, is that we do this together. We are in this all together. And if we're gonna get out of this one, it's gonna be together taking care of each other. 
and writing is, is in the process right there. And, it, and it's very hard too. Well, I just wanna say thank you to the community that's joined here. Um, thank you to everyone who has come to be in conversation, to Una Chung, to Heather Cleary, and of course, to Christina Rivera Garza. It has been such an honor to speak to you and to be in community.